Uh, good evening, my name is Bob Layson, and the topic of tonight's talk that I'm about to give is politics or mutual aid. There are those who would suppose that politics is precisely mutual aid. It's mutual aid organised. Why? It's people just looking out for one another. Isn't it as simple as that? Well, it's about as simple as that. It's simply wrong. That is not what it is. It's mutual depredation. For the advantage of some, they hope. For the advantage of some, yes, they actually achieve it. And the disadvantage of most, taken together, if you assume there might have been, um, say, growth per head of um, output in the period during which there is this politics being engaged in. So much by preamble. I might, I might have it now, a post-amble. Um, very good. There are those who suppose, mostly working for the BBC, I imagine, who suppose that the that politics is a great advancer of the welfare of the people. That, uh, well, what does it take care of? Inequality, one way or the other. Um, growth, though we don't want the wrong sort of growth, of course. Um, equality of uh, pay, if at all possible. Uh, equality of lifespans hasn't yet been uh, announced as a policy, but that might, might be there to come. Uh, these things are politics. And how does politics proceed? Well, it's by taxation, it's by um, compulsion, it's by um, compulsion and taxation. I think that's about it, really. Or telling people how if they must do something, it must be done in this manner or another manner. Usually a more expensive manner or a more ugly manner. To bring up a topical uh, example of this, I've noticed over the past year or so that a lot of um, not really attractive buildings in the first place are requiring ugly steel railings around the roof. Uh, flat roof buildings, obviously, um, are not listed buildings perhaps, but even there it might be the case. But you see them more and more, and I think, well, to go and work on a flat roof, which usually a modern building, to go and work on a flat roof requires, well, equipment and training. And people who go and work on flat roofs have both, both equipment and training. Uh, now, there are some buildings, hotels, other buildings, where the roof is actually a play area. But they have sufficiently high um, balustrades that there's no need for anything else. That's just, you know, if you don't want to go over the edge, don't go over the edge. That's how it works. But um, I see um, in this country, and I assume it's a, a, a European diktat, that such things are done, that we are now seeing. There are those, um, who's the one who believes in the lizard people? Um, David, David someone, XP. It's been no, no. Anyway, him, that fellow. I'm not sure he really believes in it, but he, he makes money up, makes money entertain. Oh, David Ike. David Ike. Ike. David Ike. Yeah. Duke, is, Duke is a KKK more like. Oh, yeah. <laughs> David Ike was the same thing. <laughs> David Ike was a footballer. They've already invaded, or a football commentator. He was a footballer. Yeah. Yeah. No, he, he was a footballer and then a football commentator, yeah. yeah. Um, anyway, his view is that if the lizard people are going to descend by flying saucers, they might be rather grateful especially they've got a fear of heights, by having a ratings put around them. Now, I don't think it's quite that. I think there's certainly some bureaucrats somewhere, possibly in the, uh, the European Union, who think, oh, well, this is a place of work. Now, it is a place of work, but it's, it's either a place of recreation, some hotels have flat roofs and gardens and you can walk around, no danger, um, or it's a place where no one else goes and there are maintenance things and fans and extractors and things. So people who either have training or equipment go up there. So no bother, no problem at all. What do we find? Railings must be erected. I don't prefer it to be aliens sitting on this, but it, uh, it's not a lot better by the fact that it's, it's rational human beings somewhere who think this is a good thing. That's by way of an example. So that's one example of politics. Economics, however, although there are all sorts of theories of economics, they don't require economics to run them, pretty much. I mean, sometimes people who have some understanding of the advantage of market production for monetary exchange uh, will suggest that we well, don't do this, don't do that, don't have those tariffs, don't have those taxes. But pretty much uh, it was understood 
by Bastiat and others, even, even, of course, the great Smith himself, Ray Adam, then it doesn't have to be organised. They don't have to be run an economy. Ah, certain, um, well, certain uh, what forms of behaviour and honesty, plain dealing, keeping your contracts, acquiring a good reputation, whether you cheat or not, but if you can acquire the reputation, it's handy. And it's easier to acquire the reputation of being a plain dealer by engaging in plain dealing. Well, this is true. So um, economics kind of polices itself. Uh, politics does not police itself. It is nothing of the, nothing of the same kind. Uh, what, what could be added to trying to find cheaper methods, trying to find more attractive output, trying to get um, effective uh, advertising and the rest? I mean, they're, they're striving with all their, well, all their will. They are... They aren't entrepreneurs either do it themselves, or they hire people to do it for them. It's, it's not for lack of effort, so um, uh, what is the problem in, the, in this regard? Well, there's perhaps inequality. Inequality has been four. Four, I assume. So the idea that everyone doesn't do equally well. Well, that may be true, but it's also no less true. And to earn ten times what you previously did doesn't make you ten times as happy. That's for sure. And also economies have the advantage of um, needing no theory of how best to run them. It takes liberty and property. Now, oh, some other things, of course. A cheap and efficient recourse to law would be handy. Not that we had it, but it would be handy if we had we had it. Um, and how, how does this compare with uh, state provision? or government provision, or nationalisation. Well, it's more expensive. It's more, it's very really slow to adopt new methods. Or if it does, the new methods will be hopeless and have to be abandoned after a number of years, as with um, electrical production from windmills. It also plays into the hands of um, fear mongers uh, who, um, very really effective at mongering fear and, uh, and making people plead for um, for more government as the great enabler. Now we have all sorts of um, explanations of why intervention is necessary and useful uh, ever since well, ever since before Galbraith, of course, even, even Marx and the rest thought there would be um, repeated crises of production, that uh, wages would decline to what? So that no one could afford to be exploited. No one could get themselves alive to be exploited. Well, no, 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 surely. They. The owners would give you enough of a wage for that. Well, yes, but if they're going to do that, wouldn't it be more of their advantage to pay some people more than enough just to survive, but survive and thrive? Could that be the case in this even history? Not because of their not because of their concern for the working necessarily, though no reason to suppose they were beginning, but they would have to pay more in real terms. Or at least the ways they were paying would buy more in real terms because in the good old days, prices of the things would decline or the quality of things would, would rise uh, without government being required to um, take part in this. But now we... Um, it seems that for our safety's sake and for our welfare's sake, if that's not the same thing, government is a great enabler. It is to save us from inequality somehow by taxing some and subsidising others, by, uh, by fighting global warming, amongst other things, or whatever it is, or inequality. Uh, the government could do what markets can't. Well, that's true. Economies, however, uh, need no theory of how best to run them. People who try to run them do need a theory, and they apply to different ones. Marxist or Keynesian or whatever, there is a local. Whatever, whatever enables them to get, get on. Now, I, I don't accuse these people of being hypocrites, but they're very easily persuaded that most people 
even those more intelligent than they are, are wrong. And they have seen that um, we cannot carry on with this or that method of production or using um, fossil fuels or whatever it might be. Uh, so, whereas a market order that just solves various real problems at a local, national, international level, uh, the rest of it is simply what? But it's politics with, a, with an excuse for having more politics. Uh, we can't have do nothingism, therefore we, we, though I have said that the market order is a do plentyism, it's not do nothingism, it's not standing aside from, from the needs of the masses, it's, it's serving the needs of the masses. Also, e economic, economies need no, as far as I don't like saying economies, because it's just there are national ones or regional ones. Or what there ought to be is, you know, a money acceptable anywhere in the world, pretty much, that would be better. It doesn't have to be like that, but that would be better. And um, property acknowledged, both near and far. Uh, promises kept, as David Hume would put it, or contracts adhered to. These things are what is necessary. Bit by bit, in each practical way, they actually do, without promising it, what governments promise and do not deliver, which is full employment, growth at many digits. And they cannot do it, but they can say they're doing it. So, why is politics so good? Something. Well, it does deliver what the market can prohibitions, uh, compulsions, uh, requirements. E equal pay for what? Equal pay for what? Um, some people like to be employed in a job so much they'll take a lower wage. And, and others, others will not. These things will balance out. But where's the flexibility? Where's the, where's the human analysis here? It is pretty much missing. Rather loud. Now, it, it's still thought, naively I think, given the carry-on with um, uh, the withdrawal of Britain from, the, from under Brussels, I don't like to call it Brexit, the damn fool would have called it Brexit, or someone against it would have called it Brexit. Well, I blame the Greeks, of course, because there was previously Grexit, wasn't there, which didn't come to a Greek exit. But that's how Brexit got called. But it, had it been called uh, a return to parliamentary self-government, I think that would have sounded better. Oh, I don't, you don't have to be a raving. You don't have to be a raving statist to insist on this. <laughs> uh, and we are, after all, kinds of anarchists. But at least there's something in that idea of a parliamentary self-government. You know, don't meet too often. Don't do anything. You know, we'll let you know. That, that's better. You were about to. Uh, just just a technical intrude. Oh, oh, oh. It should be you kicks it. You kicks it. An even uglier word. <laughs> that's, that's why I would, would have referred to it as a turn to parliamentary self-government, because that sound like a good, sounds like a good thing. <laughs> We're being shut out, excluded. <laughs> what are we going to do? It's a crash. It's falling over a cliff. What are we wrong with that? It's a step in, it's a step in the dark. What is wrong with that? Of course, your parliament wants to step in. <laughs> Well, they do seem to, don't they? Because they seem to. I mean, are these stinkers actually idealists? At all? Are these stinkers actually idealists who actually believe in this? Some will be bribed, of course, some are. But they must actually want it. Of course, they want it. They Before they remain in, they, they gave us. They gave. They said they'd done the vote because they thought the vote would go the other way. Well, obviously, yes. <laughs> to cement us for fifty years or thirty years, or whatever it might be. So why do they say it's complex? It's not complex at all. <laughs> House don't want to leave. That's why we're not leaving. There's a complex about it. Yeah, but they may, they may get left on the shelf if uh, certain parties do quite well. Well, it's the Birkin thing, you know. But still, that's a different... There is a more... There's a, uh, it's, it's thought to be hard-headed. But there is a romance of the, uh, the people's struggle. You see. Instead of simply making stuff and exchanging it for other stuff, and each pretty a lot of people doing things for other people and other people doing things for them without having to know them particularly or agree with their politics or religion, um, the market order. Uh, 
that was thought to be insufficient. You have to you have to be wanting to help people of a particular sort in a particular way. So that is what government does. Instead of simply buying and selling, inventing and investing, oh no, we are going we are going to do good. And this is true, or this will be an improvement, if commerce is seen as theft, a cause of inequality, which of a kind it is, pollution and etc. Um, people in this room might regard commerce as a, as, a, as a discovery mechanism of finding cheaper and obviously very often cleaner ways of doing something. But uh, those who think that the, that the state is the great enabler uh, would not agree. How then uh, is government to free us from inequality? Ah, by taxing unequally. Um, let that sink in. Pause for laughter. No laughter. Move on. I mean, state employees effectively pay no tax. They needn't. It would look embarrassing if it was if their pay slip said free of tax, no taxes. We pay them less, but they pay no taxes. Oh, I want to pay my. I want to do my bit. But it wouldn't make any difference at all. We're still, we're still costing as much. People are so silly. So then the um, oh, <laughs> it's title: mutual aid versus state provision. Well, state provision is just a, a very inadequate, and that's being kind, way of providing anything. Well, why should anyone suppose any other way? Oh, well, except large armies in the event of war, perhaps that's. I think you'd probably get more than more people signing up if they had to. Although the first world war, sadly, was an example of you know, people queuing up the next day. Got to go over there and biff the Kaiser, or whatever. They loved it, yeah. welcomed it, but they still had to introduce a conscription later. <laughs> they didn't welcome it after Christmas. No. <laughs> they got to be over by Christmas. Yeah. Once people came back across the channel with bits missing, that may have. Um, any more difficult to have the new lot? Yeah, it's happy. Well, we now have a situation whereby government is seen as the great, well, if not enabler, the great preserver from various bugaboos, as um, Mencken said, most of them bogus. <laughs> they're, they're there to frighten us and then save us from imaginary. Uh, and one of the imaginary ones is, um, of course, Runaway global warming. We ought to be safe from this by having very expensive electricity. This will not save us from dying in the winter if we're, if we're old. But hey, come on, kind of like break an egg to make omelets. Did Lenin actually say that? Uh, yes, but he wasn't the first one to say it. I wouldn't have thought. <laughs> I didn't say it in English. You may have said it in French. You probably had French. Oh, you probably did say it in English. Yeah. You know, uh, a lot of the Bolshevik, I mean, the Bolshevik went through a split took place in London. The conference in London, Russian and Social Democratic Party, in London. You the the cup, mm -hmm. I suppose we ought to... Come to a rising finale. I like people. People can be useful. Even the people I don't like can be useful. And I like them for that reason, if nothing else. If they get themselves an honest job, not toast funded, if they're not part of a state enforced monopoly, I like them. I like their output even more sometimes. I don't have to meet them. Because I wish I loved the human race. I wish I loved its silly face. I wish I loved the way it walked, I wish I loved the way it's talked. And when I'm, I'm introduced to one, I wish I thought, what jolly fun. I forget who wrote that. But, uh, oh wait, no, no. Uh, so, the idea that the state is the great enabler, uh, well, it, it didn't do too well, which is why Mr. Mr. Thatcher did quite well, because the state industries had to be closed down or much rearranged. To make up for that, we now have the state saving you from certain death. 
actually we're all going to enjoy certain death at a certain time but for example global warming so we're going to have new methods of electrical production such that old people won't be able to afford electricity <laughs> well they were like fair enough well man no, I want to live there they are not being of any use anymore no 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 they're not to date with fashion they don't, they don't say the recent slogans they're not with it no one says with it anymore that shows how far I'm not with it or whatever so to conclude commerce is a discovery mechanism it is mutual aid in practice you may not love every consumer who consumes your products but you don't dislike them you know you'd fake it you fake a friendly smile and a handshake at them they keep on buying because they keep on buying legislation and the state compulsion is quite different entirely different it gives us schools and hospitals as if there wouldn't be schools and hospitals without state provision as for inequality well I'm not upset by it but I'm rather upset by being taxed for the little I do earn So uh, the market order, as I see it, is mutual aid. And state provision is, to a great degree, mutual depredation. I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Any questions or points to this? Well, I, I would, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I would say you've been a, a little uh, disingenuous by saying um, I could do uh, both. People, uh, you know, paying more for their electricity and, and can't afford it because it's green. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm not a pro green. I wouldn't cast myself as a pro green person, but I mean, <clears throat> that's the whole idea of the social state that is that they can afford the basics like electricity. I mean, that's the whole idea of statism, isn't it? Ooh. Welfare. Um, the, 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 the electricity would cost more. The general idea is that the, 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 the poor are not going to pay for it. That, that's, that's how the state perceives itself. I mean, it, um, you know, it's going to be paid for by people who can afford it. Um, incidentally, stepping, I mean, if you're just stepping back from that a little bit, I mean, the, the amount of... Um, Carbon or it's carbon dioxide, at least produced by a small island. I'm pleased you called it carbon dioxide. <laughs> produced by a small island off the coast, west coast of Europe, is, is ridiculous compared to the, uh, oh, you know, the, the overall economies like China. But on that subject, it's, the whole thing is absurd. Yeah, I mean, that, that is. But, but then again, just on, on that technical point, that I, I, I can see the, 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 the rationale behind it. Um, but uh, I don't think that um, I, was, I, I was I was wondering about what you were saying about tax and about, certainly about people not uh, not being um, uh, uh, not having less money, you know, because of the, the fact they pay tax and uh, they, they they would be they they would be happy to pay tax. If they paid enough, they'd be happy. Um, I, yeah, I, I can see what you mean there, but I, I just, I was, I've always wondered, actually, I've been trying to get to the bottom of this, where if you didn't have tax and you could uh, subsidise the, the, the state uh, services, education, for example, and hospitals in another way, for example, by printing money, which what they did. They ah, do ah now, interesting topic. I, I know that at the moment, Not they, tonight. They, at the moment, it just creates bubbles most of this uh, printing. Amongst people. other horrors, and, yes. And, and, and it's given to the wrong people. Well, printing, oh, printing. I mean, if you, if you ask, I mean, if you... Printing if you, money is taxation. Yeah, well, 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 well I'll, I'll, ah, to, but I'll also, come to that now. I'll, it also I'll, wipes out yeah, yeah, right, indebtedness, which is well, well, popular. Well, well, I'll come and will become now. very popular. The, 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 but the point I want to make is, I don't want to get a into a technical argument about this, but the point I'm making is that I wonder if there's, if other ways have been explored properly where you could finance a state-run uh, essentials in other ways than taxation. 
Um, the, the few people I've spoken to about this have assured me that it won't work, that you do need well, no, for No, it happened in the past. I, I, I no, one else, no one else provided gas or electricity but the state, and you paid for it. I mean, it worked. In a sense, it worked. No, I mean, I mean with, with a collection of money. Uh, I mean, they have to, I mean, you could you could print money that cause an inflation yes. and finance the state that way without having taxation, for example. Oh, well, that's is this is new monetary theory, a topic for another talk. Yeah, not what I mean necessarily, but this chap here might. Um, mm. Yeah, um, thanks for the talk. Uh, so, I, I'm 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 strong. I mean, I used to think that the state was probably never necessary. It was certainly always immoral. But if, if I look into history, I, I start to think that there, there are good side effects of this immoral entity, which is it does make it possible to coordinate, to cooperate with people that you don't know legally, because it creates some kind of legal, legal, um, legal order. That's not to say that it's necessary today, because I think today we could have institutions that do something similar based on, on capitalist institutions. But I think historically, the, the strength the case is pretty strong that by providing a big leviathan, a side effect, even though that wasn't the intention behind it, the intention was to create the biggest gang of thieves, essentially. But what you what you did get is you get one legal order um, uh, protected by a, a, a strong army, and that makes it possible to, and that strong army could then guarantee contracts between parties that don't really know each other personally. Because be previous to that, you could only cooperate with people that you could trust, and you can only trust people that you know. So that, that makes cooperation a, a bit... Uh, I, I'm not sure if that's true. Hume and others made uh, keeping your promises, uh, you know, it was an advantage to you and to those to whom you promised. So once the idea of keeping to your contracts, acquiring a reputation, being known on the stock exchange or elsewhere, being known by the banks, ah, oh, well, if you're dealing with them, you didn't worry so much. Well, they, they always pay up if they can. Um, so I, I don't think that that's really a, gra uh, a great advantage, especially as in those days you were paying in real money, very often you know, gold or silver coin. Um, so people people would keep to the contracts because it simply pays each party to do so. Sometimes someone would really run off with the money or, you know. But, but how do you know what reputation someone has? You need to know them quite well. And um, no, the state basically made it possible that you could cooperate with people that you didn't know very well. Simply by signing a contract, you know whoever that person is, if he breaks the contract, there will be Leviathan who will punish, punish him. Um, and I think that that's, that's a very strong strong argument. And I, I, I'm still an anarchist in the sense that I believe we can create big institutions based on on, uh, on capitalism, basically, that, that work for customers, that compete with each other for customers, that provide a similar service, which is if someone breaks a contract, they will, they will punish the person who breaks the contract, and then I don't have to trust everyone I make a contract. I think firms, especially as regards as shareholders, major shareholders, and banks from which they may have borrowed and wish to borrow again in the future, to become a known quantity, to have an established reputation, it's all in their interests not to take the money and run, which is why my few of them do. But many of them, they might take the money and malinvest, but then not everyone knows malinvestment before it hits them, including those who lend money. Uh, a weakness, a weakness that goes inside is that the states were a very limited domain, and they certainly didn't. Uh, you know, certainly, one way of getting away with murder is by committing murder in England, say, and going to, say, France, you know, you know because, of the, because of different jurisdictions. But uh, you've got massive evidence of, uh, in Wales and in Cornwall, of very, very extensive, even extensive by modern standards, tin production and exportation. And uh, in Cornwall, and uh, copper production and exportation in Wales. But this went around the world, and was certainly uh, it wasn't under any state jurisdiction. In fact, these tin uh, mines in Cornwall and the copper mines in Wales are way older than uh, than any. Uh, it's long before the Romans came here, 
and way old, older than any functional state. I mean, England at that time, when the Romans came here, England wasn't a functional state. There was many di different tribes. Uh, but this trade, on an industrial scale, I mean, it's massive. I mean, the, the amount of... You know, the, you just, I mean, the, the, uh, Hugh Edwards did a history of Wales on TV, and he brought the cameras in, and <laughs> you could see... The copper that had been removed from the it was massive, even by today's standards. Is it, is awesome, it, is it like and yet that was many years ago. So, so I wonder, be, be, of course, if, uh, money is, is one other uh, aspect where how you can uh, cooperate, but just immediately pay cash, you go to the person who has it, then you pay cash, then you don't need to trust anyone because mm -hmm. there's no future contract, and that way you can facilitate that. But how do you plan long term by building up a business with, with a business partner? Uh, without knowing the people too well, uh, with, um, without having some kind of really strong legal assurance that, that, that people... Well, well, the point is they did. This is my point with the Wales and the Cornwall thing. Yeah, no, no. They I think did. The point, but did they really? Oh, or, yes. or did they just produce something and then the customer came, sold it to them, moved it to the next station and then they sold it there? Or, or did it they... Was, it was a, you know, the, the uh, amount of copper from Wales had to go around the world. Had to go around the world. It probably went as far as China, South America, perhaps even. And it was directly paid from there? Uh, it was sold in, in Wales, yeah. Yeah, well you pay in gold. It'd be difficult to pay in copper. Because yeah. <laughs> that's what that's what buy. Yeah, did the Chinese pay the wells or did Although did, did, uh, did, 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 did it move forward? I, I, should, the Silk Road. I should point out And yeah. the Chinese didn't at the end of the Silk Road, what they knew is their little people and but the point is they put orders in for copper and got it. I should point out that the idea of paying for copper and copper is not silly. This is precisely what happens with gold and other precious metals that are going to be used as coinage. That um there is a technical term for it, but those who get the, the gold give it to a mint, and it needn't be a state mint, a monopoly mint, they give it to a mint, and what the mint do is they turn it into coins, but don't give them the exact weight back. They keep a certain percentage, an agio, I think it's called. So the, the, those who turn it into coin keep some of the coins back, and that's their payment. But, but, the, but the gold miners or the silver miners don't mind because they're getting the coins they can use. They, they're, they're acceptable, they're known, especially some some coins, some Greek coins, I think. For a thousand years they were used. I mean, they were out, but the, the people trusted them when they saw them these again. Couple, I, don't, I, I don't think those miners were paid, though. These couple, these couple, these couple mines were on, on, on par with Stonehenge, that sort of area. Oh, yeah. Yeah, way before the Romans ever came here. Way before. I mean, I think, is, is it Lancaster? What, and it's, it's, what's the resort it's, it's there? It's Paris. I mean, it's, yeah. you, you think that, I mean, I think most, I mean, I would have, before I saw the, would have known this thing, you couldn't have that scale before about the 19th century. There's no way you could ever have that sort of scale before the 19th century, but they had it back then. Or Stonehenge itself. And it still puzzles us. Well, how the hell did they move those great big bloody blocks of stone miles? You know, right from. Wales right down to Wiltshire. We don't we don't fully understand that they did it. We got fairly serious and so on, but they were doing things on a massive scale. About Aliens them. did it by levitation <laughs> devices. I saw a program about it. Must be true. If you, I mean, uh, that was uh, Salisbury Plain was a military base during the First World War. There was nothing standing there. The army were using it. It just wasn't there. Uh, well, the, that sounds untrue. Some of them were put. Some of them may be put back up again. Yeah. But I don't think... I, I remember the time you still had to walk up and bat them, which are not now. The guided tours. But uh, admittedly, people were starting to take hammers and not lumps off them, which is not, well, the a, not a good thing. Well, the solstice, didn't they? Mm. The used to be there every solstice. Yeah. They all called themselves by one name, didn't they? Was it Bill or something? They had one name. All the groups called themselves by one name. They had 5,000. <laughs> they all called themselves Bill, I think. Some, some. I think it would help to have middle names at that point. <laughs> well, there, there was a famous painting in, in, from the 17 or 1800s, I can't remember now, the, 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 the painting of Stonehenge. There was only one stone standing. <laughs> oh, some of them were put <laughs> back. from 2001 no, I think, What's the other one? Is it Aysbury Circle? I think yeah, some of that was put yeah. back. And there's, there's some in Ireland as well. Some of that was put back, yeah. There's yeah, smaller things in Ireland, yeah. The, Rom the Romans had a tendency anyway to, to, to rip up and smash any religious okay. stuff. 
it would never have survived the Roman invasion. No, you're quite wrong. The Romans were very intolerant of all religions. Yeah, I think I think very intolerant of all religions. But well, uh, in Wales, they were <laughs> all available religions. <laughs> They certainly, uh, oh no, no, they, 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 they didn't like the Druids. The Druids the, the reason why they didn't like the Druids because the Druids had stories about them that frightened them. The Druids, the Druids seriously frightened the Romans. Well, uh, and uh, the, so they fell out with the Druids. They also fell out with the Jews because the Jews also were a bit scrappy and they frightened them. But uh, most religions, the Romans welcomed. But oh, yeah, the, 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 those show temples dedicated to all, all the gods. In, in, right. in a nutshell, can I, if I just point out very quickly that I mean, one thing they did want to do was to use miners as slaves so they didn't need to pay. Because Bob mentioned earlier about these miners being paid in gold and what have you, and they're all oh, they everything's hunky dory and everything's lovely. <laughs> wasn't like that at all. Slaves are not always a good way of doing things. Yeah, yeah, he thinks I know, they are. I, I, he I, thinks I, they I, are. Yeah, well, I've heard the argument about that. It's, uh, mm. In that case, how come it was, it was slaves were used for so long? Well, for well, something. Thousands and thousands. In fact, it's still being used today. Yeah, but yeah. What, how is it people did bloodletting for so long? Because they're bloody ignorant, that's why. Mm. That's why they had bloodletting for so long. Well, I think in some ways uh, slaves are, well, are useful, uh, if, if very simple task or whatever. And well, I, but I, the, the case has been made out for them by the, in fact, the, the, uh, I dealt with in my talk, uh, yeah. he, he won the Nobel Prize, for, you know, my talk on Adam Smith and slavery. Uh, so the Nobel Prize was given to a chap who held the slavery was profitable. Was? Well, yeah, but he, uh, but he, against Smith, he made the case against Smith, but I, I think it's a bit dicey. If, 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 I'd like to take advantage of this, being on camera, to point out that um, in much of slavery, through much of history, um, you were someone's slave, and if you ran away, you'll be brought back, and you might be um, punished. But many a slave was allowed to go into town and set up a carpenter's shop or this shop. In other words, he could go and work for someone, not work for his owner, providing he paid a bit on the, you know, a bit of, a bit of what he earned. And this is precisely what free people in liberal democracies are now in exactly the same position. Oh, go and find your own job. Oh, we'll allow you your freedom, but give us some 33% of it. Why isn't, why, isn't that, why isn't that slavery? In fact, in America, it's even worse because the American president, who was recently black, I don't mean he's changed his color, but was recently a black American president, blackish American president, <laughs> And he was the he was the greatest slave owner in American history, because people in prison who were slaves are very often either required to work if they want to get their full ration, or they get a few perks if they, if they and, work. And in the U.S., they literally trick them into uh, breaking all kinds of silly laws so that they can get them to prison so well, that they can work for them. That might be happening, yes. If especially if commercial companies are running the prison, they 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 have to. Biggest prison population, I think, on, on Earth outside of maybe North Korea or whatever. But uh, there's a reason for that because they make a profit out of this. Oh, some people make a profit out of this, which is not a good way of uh, No. <laughs> Unless yeah. they, yeah, they're real murderers or something. Yeah. Right. Any more? I think we're done. Okay. Thank you very Thank much. You. That was.